John, we've had CEOs, we've had doctors. What do you got for me today? Well, I've got a doctor CEO with a lot of opinions. Our friend, Dr. Sachin Jain, CEO of Scan Health Plans. He checks the boxes. Welcome to Care Talk, your pandemic home for incisive debate about healthcare business and policy. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of CareCentrics. John, is there a doctor in the house? Oh, Dr. Sachin Jane. Welcome, Sachin. Sachin is the CEO, uh, MD, and leader of Scan Health Plans. Thank you very much. Great to be here, John, David. I was uh, reading your article in Forbes. I, I thought, as I recall, wasn't Forbes, didn't they call it the capitalist tool? Wasn't that what it was? So I think... <laughs> I don't know if you're the, if if you're a capitalist tool or not, but you had you wrote something about twelve unsettling lessons uh, about healthcare, and there were there were some that that stuck out. But what what, what why did you write that? Well, you know, it was a it was at a time where I was really ready to reflect on you know an almost twenty year journey trying to make healthcare better and um, running into a predictable set of obstacles, a, a repeatable set of obstacles that I think got in the way. And, um, you know, I would say I'm far less naive than I once was, but I'm in many ways, because I'm sort of now more aware of some of these obstacles and challenges, I'm, I'm far more hopeful. So, um, you know, it was just a, a moment where I wanted to kind of reflect on, you know, some of the things that I've learned and share them with others. John, Sachin gave us a dozen lessons. What, what were your favorite ones? How can shared savings be a bad idea, Sachin? I mean, you've got this this notion that there's way too much uh, spending in healthcare. There's a ton of waste. If you could identify it, why wouldn't you uh, sh share the savings uh, with the constituents so that we can also hopefully accelerate reforms we need? I mean, isn't that the whole premise of value-based reimbursement? Look, I'm all about sharing savings. If I had a nickel for every person who wanted to share in the savings, uh, I, you know, I'd have a couple hundred thousand bucks right now because everyone's intervention uh, you know, is supposedly going to create a 35% reduction in cost. If I use several of them, you know, how do I attribute one person's you know, savings created, you know, versus another's? Uh, and so um, that's why I think that this notion that everybody is going to create shared savings is one that is, is challenging. I was just reflecting the other day on, uh, on Proteus, which is, you know, a digital therapeutics company, the company that was going to tag pills with, you know, some microchips that would enable us to sense adherence. And we had had a number of conversations with Proteus. And what they wanted to do is take credit for reductions in readmissions. Um, meanwhile, you know, this, was, this was when I was at Caremore. You know, we were doing 100 different things to try to reduce readmissions. Um, and the question I asked is, why should you get credit for all of those 100 things? Well, Sachin, I think somebody was on to them because I think with those nickels you have in your pocket, you could have purchased Proteus for what they originally eventually sold for. Yeah, I think I, I think I think you're right. I think you're right. John, my favorite one was the very first one, which I thought was a provocative one and like a really sharp pointed stick, which was things are the way they are because someone wants them to be that way. Where'd you get that from? You know, at the end of the day, one man's um, waste is another man's profit. And that's something that you start to realize when you start to follow the money. Um, and I think, you know, we don't do that enough. Um, we sometimes get stuck on these like superficial, you know, perspectives on, oh, well, such and such company is introducing this intervention to improve chronic disease management, and it's going to, you know, save the world. Um, when in fact, when you kind of follow the dollars, you realize that we make a, as a, as a healthcare industry, we make a lot of money off of really poorly managed, you know, chronic disease. And so sometimes these efforts are, you know, are more cosmetic. And they are real. You know, we have to kind of realize that. We have to have honest conversations about it. You know, one of the first lessons I learned, you know, when I was a student of public policy was you have to get the explanatory model right, meaning you have to understand you know, why things are the way they are. And I think in healthcare, we oftentimes don't get the explanatory model right. And as a result, we build the wrong solutions because we've defined the problem. But isn't that kind of hard, Sachin, because everybody in healthcare is at some level either indirectly or directly part of the heroic healing process. I, I think I think of you know what we're trying to do at CareCentrics and what you've done at, at CareMore and at Scan at helping keep, keep people out of hospitals can seem sort of uh, rather uncouth at a period when the, the hospitals are seen as the, the centers of healthcare. I mean, I think that your point about the explanatory model is 
these fear. But I also think it's, it's added to this heroic model of healthcare, which also gets us in trouble. It, it's not just about money. It's sometimes about the the broader social narrative. I, I couldn't agree more. And you know, that's why I would say, you know, you can't hate the players. You got to hate the game. Um, but I'll say the game is really set up in many ways um, for the players to act the way that they're acting. And, um, you know, when, you know, part of my work at Caremore was, you know, working with delivery systems around the country to try to, you know, help them transform their, their business models um, and move, you know, from this volume model, volume-based fee-for-service model to, to risk. And at the end of the day, you know, it's very challenging to get people to think about this alternative way of operating. And then you realize that even though you're presenting them with an alternative way of operating, they're so fixed in their business model, we make money with heads and beds, that they don't want to make the change. And these are the uncomfortable facts that we need to have more and more conversations about. You know, the care centrics of the world, you know, the care mores of the world, scans, you know, I think we're aligned around business models that, that create value when patients are less sick. But that is the exception, not the rule. And I think, you know, people like us, we, we spend a lot of time in the exceptional world. And so, you know, we forget that the dominant healthcare system that we have in this country is one that rewards people disproportionately for um, for taking care of really sick people as opposed to uh, keeping, you know, rewarding them for making them not sick. Sachin, one of the things that we've been very effective at is empowering, sort of looking at the agency problem of patients and caregivers and how in many ways, uh, whether it's directly or indirectly, people are enfeebled psychologically and practically as patients and as families trying to get care. Um, you know, when we can really empower, inform, and support the patients and really get they and their families, show them how to help navigate it, it we're far more effective. But do, but do you do you see that enfeeblement as a as a global problem? And what are we going? What how are we going to solve it? So just talking before you answer that one, I, John is good at coining these phrases, and I think they should be trademarked. He 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 came up with patient empowerment movement, and now he's coming up with a patient enfeeblement movement, which I think could be just as effective. Well, I you know I think the fact that you you know we need to quote unquote empower people and give them tools to navigate is a is a reflection of the fact that the system is you know so sorely broken you know, to begin with, and so I think the redesign shouldn't happen with patches that we apply to the system. Um, although those patches are helpful and necessary right now, given the system that we have. But I think we have to take a deeper look at figuring out why it's so freaking hard to get an appointment to see someone when, in fact, in almost every other industry, you can go online and click a few buttons and actually solve that problem. Um, you, know, we're, you know, we don't necessarily think about these issues because we have access to lots of people. But I can tell you, I'm in the process of navigating some care for my mother right now. It's it's hard. It's really, really hard. Um, you know, even with all the social capital we have, all the uh, you know financial capital we can bring to bear to solve these problems, um, the system is just you know it's just hard and clunky to get around because it's not built to be easy for patients. Um, I, I don't know that it's built to be easy for anybody. Honestly, I think there's a lot of folks who you know historically have said, "Oh, it's it's built around you know the people who deliver the care." We'll ask the people who deliver the care whether they think that's true, and they would tell you it's exactly not the case. So, um, you know, it's just overcomplicated. It's it's uh, it's a bit of a mess, and it's designed um, without without a real design. Sasha, not to take anything away from your 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 point about what you're going through now, but you also said that using your own experience is often a poor way to design healthcare. What what do you mean by that? Well, and 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 I and I mean that because at the end of the day. Um, most of us who are in positions of leadership in healthcare don't actually have authentic patient experiences. Um, you know, I was before this you know call started. I was talking about the experience of getting my dad on home home based dialysis. Um, you know, we have as a family, we've got a lot of social support. We've got a lot of people who can help my dad. Um, my dad is a physician himself, so he's got a lot of kind of connectivity and understanding of his medical condition. Um, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be my dad without uh, without that social capital, without that knowledge, um, because, you know, and frankly, there are more people like that than there are people like my dad. And so if I were to take my father's experience and say, well, everyone should have home based dialysis, you know, because my dad is having a good experience with it, um, I might make a logical mistake there, because at the end of the day, there's a lot of folks who don't necessarily have the same kind of support that I have. So I still stand by that. 
It's sort of like when it's sort of like when John plans the, the Christmas party. You know, he just sort of generalizes from his own experience. He's inviting a hundred people, and so he orders ten thousand gin and tonics and nine hundred lobsters. And for some reason, he can't figure out why there's so many leftovers. There are people who are not CEOs of Fortune fifty or Fortune one hundred companies whose experiences are far worse. And those are the people uh, whose experiences we really need to understand and solve for because they're not going to be able to you know, break into Boston Children's or Mass General at a moment's notice. Yeah, I, I guess I'd take the other side of that, Sachin, in the sense that I think we need to build on those to generalize. I mean, just having had the experience of trying to get my mother an appointment at uh, Mass General, which required the conversation with her doctor, the only way the conver- I ended up getting the doctor to call me back was to tell the person that my mother was going to die in an hour. And, and that works, by the way. <laughs> but I think from a user center, I, I, I take your point, particularly elite folks in healthcare really don't have a clue because they have a lot of connected capital. But I think if we can build on the front the, and, and, and honestly validate the insanity of the, of the consumer experience, the patient experience, I think we actually would chip away at some of the reforms we need. Um, I, I'd, be, I'd be interested to, which, what's the biggest thing you learned at Caremore, taking care of complex chronics, um, where you're part of a large organization and that you're applying now at SCAN, now that you've got control of the wheel and, and, are, and are running the health plan? What's the biggest change you're, you've invested in? Well, you know, I, the one thing that I can say um, was, was most compelling for me was actually seeing the power of the transition of care away from kind of centers um, to actually the home. Um, we launched uh, a number of different home-based products. We had our iSNP product, which is our touch product. Um, we had uh, a home-based primary care model in your backyard in Connecticut uh, for duels. And um, you know what we, what we were able to, I think, start, begin to optimize really was the delivery of care to the home. I think historically people have not seen that as a financially viable model because on a fee-for-service chassis, it isn't. But in risk-based models, um, when you have the right patients, you can actually do magical things for people at home. Now, you know, coupled with advances that we have in remote patient monitoring, um, I think that there's you know, some really exceptional things that can begin to happen. And it's why one of the first things that we're, we're working on right now is actually a build out of a home-based um, geriatric primary care medical group It'll also have some virtual elements. Sachin, do you think that uh, seniors can handle technology or is that really just for the young folks? I think everyone can handle technology. They just need, you know, we need to titrate the level of support that you give them. One of the most kind of interesting benefits we introduced uh, this year at SCAN um, you know, was, was actually a help desk, a technology help desk for seniors so that we could actually answer their wide array of questions that they, that they have around how to use technology. In addition to you know, the, the questions that they have around how to access healthcare through technology. And I think COVID proved that all the stereotypes we have about seniors and their ability to access technology were just those, they were, they, they were stereotypes. And so um, I do think, again, that there are certain populations that have you know, health literacy issues, literacy issues more generally. And again, we our job is to titrate the level of support to the needs that people have. Sachin, as a doctor, um, how much of the current problems in the system, the over complexity, is really driven by the fact that we've built a system around doctors and for doctors, um, and how much of it is because we haven't engaged the doctors enough. There, there, there are strong opinions on both sides. A lot of folks in managed care organizations think they <laughs> know more than the doctors, and the doctors feel the same way about managed care. We've got this ongoing war. It's at, at the forefront of innovation, now that you're sort of on both sides of it, as a doc and as a, as a, as a managed care person, where do you sit on that argument? Yeah, and I, and I would say, you know, again, I don't, I don't mean to give you a hedging answer here, but I think doctors are a heterogeneous group, and um, you know, you have to separate out primary care docs from specialists, um, and 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 view these view this question, you know, very differently. I, you know, my personal perspective is that we have not sufficiently empowered or built the system around primary care. Um, one of the kind of key concepts I took from my time at Caremore was something one of my colleagues, Dr. Balugadi train me on, which is this notion of the confident generalist. Um, we don't actually empower a confident generalist in a traditional fee-for-service healthcare system. Um, we actually ask you know, generalists to farm out lots of care to lots of different people. And as a result, we create this highly you know, non-coordinated patient care experience. So I think you know, we need to build the system around 
you know, the, the primary care relationship with patients. And I don't think we've done that. Um, and I think, you know, most doctors would actually agree with that, provided they were paid accordingly. And again, I think the system has just, you know, we have everyone on this treadmill of trying to produce as many RVUs as they possibly can uh, to kind of you know, make what they made last year. That's not sustainable. Sachin, you had experience earlier in your career working uh, for the VA, and I know you have a, a legit job now, but what if the new president, Biden, asked you to run the VA? Would you do that? Look, I, I'm uh, a patriot at heart. I will always you know, uh, you know, serve if I can serve, but I, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. I think at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I've made a commitment to scan, love what I'm doing, love the opportunity that I have. Um, but, you know, the opportunity to create change at scale is something that, you know, we, we all have to embrace when given the opportunity. So, Sachin, another question on that same topic. Uh, you're, you're the brain trust for the, the new um, secretary of the, the VA. And other than avoiding uh, uh, cranky Congress people and senators, what's your advice to help reform what, what it appears, at least from a distance, to be a pretty broken system? So I actually think, you know, so the VA does some, some things tremendously well. Um, and I, there's a certain number of conditions that I think people uh, acquire when they are veterans that are, you know, traumatic brain injury, um, you know, kind of uh, downstream risks associated with certain exposures that you get when, when you're uh, in the military um, that really can't be bought in the pri private sector. Um, so I, what I think is that we do over time need to evolve to a model that I think looks a little bit more like an integrated payer provider model that leverages the best of the private sector, but also, you know, provides the things that you can't otherwise buy in the in the public sector for veterans and provide care in those instances, but then you know pay for care in other instances. So I I personally believe that um, you know the VA d does a lot of things that the rest of the healthcare system can actually learn from. I mean the integration of payment provider. The fact that everything's on a common information system makes it actually really easy to be a, you know, a patient in a highly functioning VA system. Now, what I will say is not all VA systems are created equally. They have, there's similar platforms, but the quality is highly variable across the country. And I think that's where we need to start to, to look at you know, some of the opportunities to reduce the variation that exists across VAs and across geographies. So, Sachin, I got a question for you. Should the patient be thought of as a consumer or are those two separate things? You know, I, I think these words are, are kind of silly in a lot of ways. I mean, I think, and you hear, you know, managed care executives call patients consumers. It sort of drives me crazy. Um, you know, I, you know, you hear patient advocates get angry that they're called patients. That, that drives me a little bit crazy. At the end of the day, I, you know, they're called. At the end of the day, I am going crazy. At the end of the day, what we're talking about is people. And what we want is people to be treated like people. And what I mean by that is we want to be able to treat people like we would want uh, our favorite relatives treated. I wouldn't say, you know, treat, treat them like mom because some people don't necessarily treat their mothers all that well, but like our favorite relative, right? That's what we have to kind of treat people like. And whatever language we use, we have to, you know, imbue those values into it. The reason I don't love the word consumer is because people don't always want to be shopping for healthcare in their most vulnerable moments. They just want to be cared for. Um, the reason that the word patient gets you know, challenging for people is because it places them in a sick position as opposed to an empowered position. But I would say I'm not convinced everyone wants to be empowered when they're sick. They, a lot, most people when they're sick just want the right things to happen for them um, more often than not. And that's really what we should all be driving towards, whatever language we use. Well, that is a great way to end this edition of Care Talk. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of Care Centrics. Thanks for listening.